I'm Leo Walder for Kit Guru. It's been a year since AMD launched Ryzen. Now, that was Ryzen 7, 1700, 1700X, uh, 1800, 1800X. The big news being a whole new platform for AMD, a whole new architecture called Zen, uh, and eight cores with 16 threads of processing power. And then they followed it up with Ryzen 5, Ryzen 3. Uh, that is now ancient history because, of course, Intel uh, counterpunched by launching uh, Coffee Lake, its 8th gen CPU, which moved from quad core, which they've been using for years, to six cores. And six Intel cores closed the gap on eight AMD cores and gave AMD a bit of a fight for their money. Uh, so now it's time for the riposte from AMD. So uh, we have two CPUs launching today. We have the Ryzen 7 2700X and we have the Ryzen 5. 2600x it's the two means it's second gen so last year was 1700x 1800x uh, this year and today and for the time being just those two models uh, we have the 2700x the uh, top cpu being the 2700x as far as we are aware there is not going to be a 2800x but who knows now the significant change inside the cpu is a move from 14 nanometer fabrication to 12 nanometer the architecture remains untouched however it's still zen although they're calling it zen plus but enough chit chat let's do a quick run of cinebench because that's going to tell us a lot about what we need to know let's just crane my neck around here and click the button so this is the Ryzen 7 2700X running as it comes out of the box. The only change I've made in the uh, BIOS of this uh, Gigabyte Aorus motherboard is to enable XMP. So the DDR4 memory is running at 3400 MHz. That's mildly significant because uh, previous Ryzen's would happily run at 3200 MHz. But 3400, 3200, you know. But uh, other than that, stock clock speeds, uh, all the boosty type stuff is left uh, up to the BIOS and the CPU. And we are using, as you will see, the AMD prism cooler so it's running on an air cooler the air cooler you get with the cpu and the score we've got is 1800 marks and the reason that's significant is because the direct competitor to this process of the core i7 8700k coffee lake the six core intel processor that will run 1400 marks at stock clocks that's 4.3 on all cores and it'll run at 1600 marks in cinebench if you overclock it to 5 gigahertz which is pushing its limits beyond thermally. Obviously, it depends on the exact processor you have. Of course, you can delig Coffee Lake, but that's a different story. Uh, so 1400 or 1600, this has just done 1800 out of the box on an air cooler. Result, game over, and surely that's a win for AMD. There's no denying that uh, this Ryzen is very impressive in Cinebench. If we do another run and we keep an eye this time on the clock speeds as shown in HW monitor, and we'll see the clocks rip up to over four gigahertz and then they drop back and they basically sit bang on four gigahertz. That is Precision Boost 2 at work. What it means is that there is no longer a fixed all core clock speed in the new Ryzen 7 2700X. Essentially, it runs at the maximum clock speed possible as long as it's staying inside the thermal and power and current and voltage envelope. And that's quite a mouthful, but the score is very good. Now, this is a relatively cool room. When I was doing my testing earlier, the temperature was a few degrees higher, and actually we were 25 megahertz under the four gigahertz, uh, well, mark, not a limit, but a mark. So the clock speed is a dynamic thing. Here at Kit Guru, we review a lot of CPU coolers. So of course we think the cooler you choose to use in your brand new eight core CPU matters. Of course it does. The fact that AMD includes this Wraith Prism with the CPU, so effectively free of charge, is significant for a number of reasons. Uh, so for one thing, it's, let's call it 30 pounds of value add. Okay, that's significant because the CPU itself, or the CPU package rather, is a penny under 300 pounds, including BAT here in the UK at launch. Uh, the 8700K, which is the one, uh, the CPU they're constantly comparing it to, is about 315 at the moment. Uh, so close. Allow for the cooler, and there's quite a gap, that's about 50 pound difference. Uh, because of course Intel doesn't supply a cooler with their CPUs or not a cooler you'd want to use. Uh, so this is it's a point of differentiation. But of course, the cooler's only worth having if you're gonna use it. So if you're gonna chuck it straight in the bin, then it becomes irrelevant. If on the other hand, you think I've got it, I'm looking for the value, I'm gonna use it, then how good is the cooler? 
In terms of performance, it works. It defines this CPU as a about four gigahertz CPU, um, slightly under in a warmer climb. Uh, when it's nice and cool, it'll go just a tad over four gigahertz, all cores, and the all cores is significant because that's Precision Boost 2 and XFR2, the extended frequency range features working in harmony. Um, I have to personally say, however, I'm not mad keen on this cooler. Now, it's made by Cooler Master and you get some software with it which uh, controls your RGB lighting. That works perfectly well. It's a color wheel, it does all the usual stuff. You saw it uh, working away earlier and uh, it looks the part. I have to wonder how many people who want an eight core processor who might be in the more sort of workstation side of things are gonna want an RGB cooler looking all leery you wouldn't have thought a great many of them, which suggests this is more aimed at the uh, sort of home gamer enthusiast end of the spectrum. That's absolutely fine. But uh, I don't much like the fact it's a relatively noisy cooler. I mean, as the, uh, as the load goes up and down, the fan speed goes up and down. Uh, it's a proper PWM job. It works correctly. In addition to the PWM, we've also got the USB, which uh, controls the Cooler Master software for lighting, or you can instead plug this RGB cable in and connect it to your motherboard header, in which case your motherboard software will control the RGB lighting. That's the RGB done to death, or you can turn off the RGB if you are, as AMD says, an RGB heathen which I quite like actually. As a point of observation, this is a direct contact uh, cooler. The three heat pipes have flattened surfaces. They sit directly on the heat spreader of the uh, CPU. Uh, it's, there are grooves. I don't much like the finish. You can see lines of uh, Tim and you can also see lines on the heat spreader of the CPU. I put quite a lot of Tim on here and he's been kind of taken up by the grooves in the uh, cold plate. So you are gonna have to use quite a lot of thermal compound and check you've got a decent contact. Having said that, it works well enough. If you're intending to use this cooler, it will work out of the box. No need to go liquid if you really don't want to. And you can, if you choose, overclock to about 4.15 gigahertz. So despite me being a bit Ugh, it actually performed perfectly satisfactorily. While I talk some more, I'm gonna run Time Spy to give you a bit of eye candy. Not that there's any doubt the combination of an eight core 16 thread processor along with a GTX 1080 Ti can run time spy, but it's something to look at. And let's run around the spec of this test system. So we've got the Ryzen 7 2700X CPU running at stock clocks at the moment. We've got some G-Skill Sniper X DDR4 memory, that's 3400 megahertz. Uh, the motherboard is a Gigabyte X470 Aorus Gaming 7 Wi-Fi. Uh, graphics card EVGA GTX 1080 Ti uh, Superclock. And the cooler is a Fractal Design Celsius S24. Underneath the uh, PC, we've got a Seasonic Prime Titanium 1000 watt power supply, and the uh, SSD, which is a regular SATA drive, is from SK Hynix and is their SC311 STD. Um, two things there that stand out, um, although they may well have slipped past you. Uh, the first is that the memory is G-Skill Sniper X, which is kind of their mainstream memory, whereas uh, with Ryzen and the Threadripper up to now, we've used Flare X. Uh, one of the problems, frankly, with Ryzen is it's very pernickety when it comes to memory. Uh, this uh, Agisa, A-G-E-S-A, -E which is the uh, firmware that's to do with uh, memory compatibility, it's been an absolute swine. Uh, when Ryzen launched the original Ryzen a year ago, memory compatibility was just absolutely atrocious. Uh, and it's got better since it has, uh, and it's getting better still. Uh, but the fact is this is still a very young platform compared to all the Intel platform, well, the Intel platform that's been around now for years. The memory manufacturers and the motherboard manufacturers, they've had to get to grips with it, and they are getting there. So the fact we're now seeing Sniper X rather than Flare X, that's quite encouraging. Uh, but nonetheless, you do want to check very carefully to make sure your motherboard and your Ryzen support the memory you're using, or indeed the memory you want to buy. Also, the cooler. Have a look at the compatibility of your liquid cooler or the liquid cooler you're looking at and make sure it has AM4 mounting hardware because you'll often find that uh, Intel is covered uh, backwards and forwards but Ryzen, not necessarily. And AM4, that's going to be around till 2020. So it, it matters. Now the socket. So AM4 was introduced last year with Ryzen and it's going to be around for another generation or two. Uh, 2020 is the year they said they'll support it until. 
so this is still early days. But the fact is that despite the fact this processor is pin compatible with uh, X370 from last year, you do need a BIOS update to support it. And furthermore, to get the feature updates with the uh, Ryzen uh, second gen, you need an X470 motherboard. So I am going to get around to doing some proper long term testing with uh, Ryzen motherboards and Ryzen CPUs to uh, check compatibility with old processors in new motherboards, new processors in old motherboards. There simply hasn't been time with this launch. We've had bias revisions like you wouldn't believe over the weekend. It's really caused mayhem. Uh, and also I had a failing graphics card, which was a whole different war story. Um, so yes, the, the twin of this GTX 80 Ti, it started to fail on me and I didn't twig at first what was going on. Had all sorts of blue screens and such like I was putting it down to overheating and uh, extreme clock speeds. No nope, graphics card. Uh, so that was a real good waste of time. Back, however, to this. So compatibility, AM4. If you want to get the full benefit of Precision Boost 2 and XFR2, you need to buy a new motherboard to go to your new CPU. So your CPU is £300 or less, depending on which model you get. Uh, but your motherboard, the, I've got here a stack of motherboards, uh, and they're all high-end around £200. Now, I know compared to some of the Intel models, which can go from three to £600, that's relatively cheap. Nonetheless, if you want to buy into this platform, that's £500 right there. It's something to consider. Uh, the spec of this X470 Aorus Gaming 7 Wi-Fi is interesting in that the VRM hardware is familiar. We've seen it on Coffee Lake, Skylake and all manner of other boards. Um, I don't mean to say that Gigabyte has just recycled the hardware without thinking, but it suggests that what works with that processor family works with this processor family. And that's really encouraging to see because it means that the uh, designers aren't working from scratch. They haven't got to come up with some whole new solution. Uh, so you do need to check compatibility of your DDDR4, although that's getting better. You definitely need to double check the compatibility of your cooler, whether it's liquid or air cooler, to make sure that it will actually fit on socket AM4. There we go. Nice score. Overclocking the Ryzen 7 2700X on air, we got to 4.15 gigahertz uh, reliably uh, with the liquid cooler 4.25 and this is how I went about it. Just as the hardware of the motherboard looks conventional, so too does the BIOS. It is worth pointing out if you're not familiar with the Gigabyte BIOS, this little sort of uh, thing here, they have a little pop-up where you'll find Q-Flash. If you don't know where it is, that can be a swine to find. Uh, so, easy overclock tuner we ignore. We go down to clock ratio, and we punch in the number we want, which in this case is 42.5, four and a quarter gigahertz. Uh, XMP is already enabled, as mentioned before. And then we go advanced memory settings, we can ignore because that's all handled by XMP. Advanced voltage settings. Uh, so we were told to try it by Gigabyte up to 1.4 volts, depending on how good the CPU was. They, they were hoping we could get away actually with as low as uh, below 1.3. Uh, just wasn't to be. Uh, 1.4 is what it took. And uh, curious enough, they didn't want us messing around with the uh, uh, system on chip voltage. Uh, then if you go down to load line calibration and you've got a, a bunch of sort of names rather than one, two, three, four, um, there you go. Auto, normal, standard, low, medium, high, turbo and extreme. Turbo was the one, so I guess that's equivalent of two. Uh, they didn't say anything about the uh, load line calibration for the system on chip either, which was a surprise. And that was it. And then we simply save and exit. But before we do that, let's just rattle through the rest of the bits and pieces in there. So that just tells you what's going on in the BIOS. That's your boot manager in the usual way. Peripherals, nothing interesting there particularly to see. You've got control of RGB fusion, but uh, obviously you'll do most of that in Windows in the software. Uh, what else? Uh, all the usual stuff, SATA drives and such like. Uh, And there we go. And that should now boot into Windows quite happily at 4.25 gigahertz all cores. And voila. The test that I've found that uh, actually stresses the CPU long enough 
to actually confirm it's stable, not just a momentary thing. A uh, blender works particularly well for that. Uh, so we've got four and a quarter gig, four point two five there, and we start the render. While Blender's running, you'll want to keep an eye on CPU temperatures, so software such as uh, HW Monitor is uh, a natural choice. Uh, the funny thing is, though, that uh, AMD is really keen for you to use Ryzen Master, which is their own software, and it's got a kind of uh, Radeon driver sort of interface. Uh, the so this is version 1.3 of the software. Uh, which is new for the second gen Ryzen. If you have an original Ryzen, you can't use this software. It refuses to run, which seems a bit mean. Uh, and you have temperature and peak speed at the top. You also have this star, which denotes which is the best core if you want to try overclocking individual cores. That apparently is based on the information reported by the motherboard to do with uh, clock speeds and power. Uh, so quite how the motherboard gets that information, whether it's in the CPU or whether the motherboard's doing something clever, not entirely sure. Uh, but if you want to do that, then fine. Uh, that's not for me. Sim similarly, if you want to knock off uh, simultaneous multi-threading, i.e. reduce it from 16 threads to 8, well, OK, but then haven't you got the wrong processor? Uh, so we've got temperature reported here, uh, but... It's a big clunky piece of software. It does have a certain amount of CPU overhead. Uh, so I found it better to instead use uh, HW Info 64, which has a long list of things that it monitors. And if we scroll down, we have a couple of temperature figures, one of which is TCTL and one of which is TDI. Um, there's 10 degrees between the two figures. I'm not actually sure it's always exactly 10 degrees, but certainly it is here. And the T die figure is the one that uh, seems to be the most accurate. Uh, certainly the processor wasn't uh, throttling on me at any point. I mean, the system would refuse to run at certain clock speeds, but it, uh, it didn't sort of hit 90 or something degrees. To wrap this up, I've actually got mixed views about the Ryzen 7 2700X. It's, it's a nuanced thing. Uh, for one thing, it's only a, a marginal improvement over the previous generation Ryzen. For another, you really do require an X470 motherboard uh, to use with a new CPU rather than mixing and matching with an old motherboard. That seems quite clear. The layout, the construction of the new generation of motherboards is certainly superior to the original. Uh, so uh, you've got to budget the money. Balanced against that, the new CPUs are considerably cheaper than the first generation of Ryzen's when they launched. Uh, so in a sense, you could actually buy a new Ryzen 7 with motherboard for the same price as the very first wave of a Ryzen 7 1800Xs, which is a very pleasant surprise. Uh, as to who's going to use the CPUs and how they're going to use them, this is the thing. If you want to play games, then Intel still has the lead in uh, IPC. On the other hand, Ryzen gives you more uh, cores and it seems quite clear that's going to give you better future proofing. But at the moment, how many games require six cores, let alone four? Uh, we are moving in that direction. But right now, if you buy a coffee late with six cores, you're good. You're good for a while yet. Uh, the advantage of eight over six in gaming, really, you have to scratch around to find that advantage. But if you're doing work that requires flat out grunt, so blender, rendering, uh, video editing and such like, the eight cores of Ryzen are a winner. And here's the thing, if you're doing that kind of work, you probably already own a Ryzen. If you didn't rush out to buy the eight core Ryzen when it came out last year or one of the six cores uh, versus the four cores of Intel, why didn't you? If you didn't rush out to buy the eight core last year, rather than you know double the cores of quad core, albeit not as good, why are you now going to rush out to buy an eight core when you can buy the six core Intel? That's the conundrum. Uh, I cannot see anyone with a first gen Ryzen upgrading motherboard and processor to second gen. I mean, sure there'll be some people, but it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. The advantage you'll gain for the money you spend, not really worth the aggravation. 
Uh, if you want to go out and buy the Ryzen, good on you, it's a good choice. But I would question why you haven't already got into Ryzen. It's been out for a year and Ryzen 7, 1700 and 1800, they're good. Uh, so possibly you've just started doing more CPU intensive workloads. That, that's perfectly possible. And now you need a proper CPU and you want the six core Intel or the eight core AMD. And you could more or less flip a coin on it. That's the truth of it. I actually prefer the way that AMD handles the uh, clock speed dynamic uh, power balancing. Uh, whereas Intel, if you're overclocking the uh, coffee lake and you push it up to five gigahertz, it just gets hot. I mean, it goes faster, it gets hotter. You know, the exponential power thing that's required. If you're gonna do that, you really would be doing it a kindness to deal with it and give it some proper cooling because the package is fairly nasty. That is one area where AMD continues to shine with the soldered uh, heat spreader, uh, and they are gonna continue doing that. We hear rumors that Intel might do the same with some high-end CPUs at some point, and I say, bring it on. But here and now, that's an AMD thing, and it works well. I like the way that AMD handles the uh, dynamic speed and power uh, trade-off. They do that very well. And if they can continue to improve on that, that would be brilliant. Uh, so in that sense, AMD is actually more sophisticated to my mind than Intel. I'm not the least bit clear how many people are going to rush out to buy this processor and motherboard just because on paper it's better in certain use cases than the Intel. Uh, the previous generation was better -er. It had a distinct advantage. If you're video editing with uh, eight cores of Ryzen, you kick four cores of Intel all around the park. No two ways about it. But then, of course, you can always move up to the X299 platform and, you know, it's an endless conundrum. And if you're going to do that, why not Threadripper? Pulling this back to the absolute fundamentals, Ryzen 7 2700X works well. It delivers good results. It's been a surprisingly stable platform, uh, despite my dying graphics card, which led me down a horrible blind alley. Uh, overall, it's been good to work with so far, and I am quite confident it's going to continue to be good and will get better, because that's the nature of these things. But the fact is, I cannot bring myself to love it. Uh, I really wasn't that impressed by that Prism cooler, uh, which is a shame, because I thought I would be. Uh, when I switched over to liquid cooling, that certainly helped. It's much quieter and much more sophisticated. And that's a shame. If you buy the high-end processor, you get what looks like a decent package, but I'd be inclined to actually park the prison cooler. Shame, but there we go. So there we have it. Uh, do please head over to kitguru.net to look at the graphs and such like when I finally get around to making them, uh, because they should give you a lot more information I'll be able to put into this review. Uh, there'll be detail about power, temperature, and all the rest of it, as you would expect, plus endless benchmarks. If you like this video, thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down. If you want more from KitGuru, click to subscribe. Do hit the bell button so you can be alerted to new videos as they become available. I'm Leo Water for Kit Guru. This is Ryzen 7 2700X.